Welcome to Marketgy, the science of marketing strategy, a bi-weekly podcast where all the cool marketers discuss their favorite marketing strategies, study by study. On this show, we feature marketing risk takers who believe long-term wins for the customer equal long-term wins for the business too. How? Human-led marketing. The combination of where science, creativity, and strategy meet, or as we also like to call it, Marketgy. Let's break down the marketing trends, myths, and methodologies together. I'm your host, Leanne Dow Weimer. Let's go. Good morning. Welcome to Market G. And today we have joining us is Carol Mahoney. She's an author. She's a public speaker. She's amazing. And she has so many of these wonderful ideas that I'm so excited that she's going to share her message with us today. Carol, will you tell us more about you? Well, first, thank you so much for having me, Leanne. Um, as you mentioned, my name's Carol Mahoney. I am the founder of Unbound Growth. And Unbound Growth is a sales coaching consultancy and training firm. And the, the premise of it is that we believe that growth is possible for anyone, personal and professional, and that there are no limits to it. Um, so hence the name Unbound Growth. And you know, the the irony of it all is that I started off my career and my education in marketing and made the conversion to the dark side of sales. But I still have a marketing head, even though I have a sales heart. And, you know, I really look at sales and marketing as this this collaboration and integration. There's this the idea of like silos being between the two of them. It for me has never been the case. So I'm really excited to kind of share, you know, where I see the crossover in sales and marketing, but as well as how they can actually benefit each other in a more productive and buyer first way. I love it. I mean, there's so much to to kind of unpack there because I came from the reverse. I started off in sales and then I moved to marketing. And so let's, let's just kind of get to the meat of it. Like, how do you define where marketing starts and stops and where sales starts and stops? I look at the, the, where the stop and starts is in terms of who is it that you're talking to? So when I think of marketing, I think of marketing as a one to many, right? Is a, whether it's one to 10 or one to a thousand or one to a million, it's one message that's being spread throughout. And it's also something that's a much, uh, like higher volume, but lower touch type of a thing. So, but whereas sales and, and also to preface with that, that when you look at the way that people buy today, the majority of the responsibility is on marketing because they're doing their research online. They're going on to your website before they ever even talk to a salesperson. Um, and that's whether you're buying something on Amazon or something for your business, or even if when it's an enterprise solution, people are going online to learn more. And so it is almost like you can't necessarily see the person who you're talking to, but you have to be able to know them enough to be able to appeal to what's going on in their world and make them feel that you understand what's going on with them before they're ever going to be willing to talk to a salesperson. And then, you know, the, the start and stop for sales is when they're ready to have that conversation with a human being and not a chat bot or your website or, you know, G2 reviews, but they actually want to talk to a human being that can help them put context into all of the things that they've learned about their problem or the possible solutions that are out there. And, even though the majority of the buying journey happens in digital channels or without a salesperson involved, because there's so much information available, the challenge today for buyers isn't a lack of information. It's a lack of context as to how does this apply to me? And that's when we really want a human being to be able to help us to make decisions based on what we know now. And uh, obviously I do the work I do because that's severely lacking in a lot of sales conversations today. Um, but for me, I really do look at the integration between sales and marketing where there's that crossover, if you will, is that when sales is having these one-on-one -on -one conversations with individuals who've done this research and maybe they're frustrated that they're not finding the answers that they're looking for or the questions that they're trying to answer aren't readily available for information out there, that's information that sales can feed back to marketing to make even more quality content for them to be able to help people to understand where they need to go next in their decision making. Absolutely. I love it. Um, there's 
when you and I first met, you were coaching us um, yeah. on these sales methods. And so, um, you know, it's really easy for me to like skip to the, the end. And I don't want to do that because I want to share um, all the insights with everyone listening. Um, now, there was kind of part of the, the challenge was understanding um, where to start or, or what framework to kind of think about it as. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? So, uh, and the thing of the question that a lot of people have today in sales is where do I start with my buyers, right? We have, you know, we have the product led growth movement where we're leading with product information online so that people can help to understand and see what the actual solution looks like. And, you know, that's what they want to know is how does it work? What does it cost? Those types of things. And then we also have this motion like this, the sales led growth, where we're really focusing on understanding and diagnosing and doing these types of things. And it's almost it's like, it, like people think it's an either or you're either product led growth or your sales led growth. And it's not an either or situation. And really understanding where your buyers are really is as simple as asking a couple of questions. So, you know, if you're if someone's coming into your website and they filled out a particular form, you know, the analytics don't always tell you exactly what keyword they search for or how they got there. So ask those questions, you know, how did you become aware of this particular problem? What research have you already done? How did you hear about us? What did you hear when you heard about us? So that you can get an understanding and a framework of where they're at in their mindset and where they've already taken those steps and understanding what is it that they've already learned so that you're not repeating the same information that they've already heard. And you can actually help fill in some of the gaps in their knowledge or things that they might might not know that they don't know. Oh my God. I can't tell you how often I've been on the recipient side of a call with a vendor possibility. And I already know what they're spending our first 20 minutes telling me. And mm -hmm. we could have used that time so much more valuably. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a simple question. Like, what do you want to learn on this conversation in the next 30 minutes? Or what are you hoping to be able to do by the end of this conversation? What are your goals, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, as to what it is that you would like to get done, because it's not about us. It is about them. Right. And their own internal processes. Like you don't start on the call knowing if the person you're talking to is necessarily one of five, one of one, one of 30. I mean, it's, it's really, it's really ambiguous. Um, which is why preparation for those calls is so important. Like if, if someone puts a meeting on my calendar, I want to email them a day or two beforehand and ask, Hey, see that we're seeing, you know, talking Friday at three o'clock. Um, yeah, go ahead. Those questions. How did you hear about us? Uh, should I be thanking someone for sending you our way? Uh, what is it that you'd like to get done on this conversation that's coming up? You know, what are the most important things out of a list of things? Like you can do that work before you ever get into the conversation. And then for the love of God, go to their website, go to their LinkedIn profile, you know, see what articles they've written, get an understanding of how they think. Like this is like the super easiest thing to do is to go onto someone's LinkedIn profile and then look at what are the recommendations that they've given to other people. That'll give you a pretty clear sense on the kind of values and things that are important to them with the people that they work with. You know, if it says something like has great attention to detail and I love the way that she was, you know, one step ahead of everything that tells you, you make sure you have your ducks in a row before you start engaging with this person because they're not going to put up with fluffy nonsense. Right. Or, or the opposite. Maybe they say something about how they love that someone could adapt to changing circumstances. Exactly. That's something you should know as a salesperson. Yeah. Um, or that, you know, I loved working with this person. I would highly recommend them because they were engaging and, uh, you know, uh, conscientious of everybody on the team and made everyone feel welcome and included. These are all the clues that give you like what's important to them in a conversation or in a relationship with someone and that you can adjust your own style accordingly so that you can better relate to them. Absolutely. And then because as a marketer that is previously a salesperson, I love stealing sales techniques and putting it into marketing. Um, I, I know, like we're not reinventing the wheel here, but if you are lacking in qualitative data about your potential customers and you do exactly what you just said, all of a sudden you can kind of start to piece together some tea leaves, still tea leaves, but you know, you can, you can still guess some things that you might want to test out in your, yeah. in your content. Yeah. And I think that's the key and the, the commonality that I see in sales and marketing is the, the, willingness and openness to test 
experiment, reiterate, refine, and, and continue to do that over and over again. Because the reality is nothing stays the same. Buyer behaviors are still rapidly changing and will continue to change rapidly. I mean, you know, first it was the internet, then it was SaaS software, now it's artificial intelligence. Um, so our world is only changing at a faster rate. So the idea that what we did yesterday is gonna work here, I don't know how anyone can still think that way and survive. I would wish that they wouldn't, um, <laughs> you know, and, and I always bring up the, the old stereotype of sales and marketing being the very heavy handed, like hard sales tactics. And think, thankfully that is not how things usually work now. And when people start to sense that you're very sharky about your marketing or your sales, they back off and they, they run away. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And, you know, on this, this vein, I, I do a lot of coaching calls where sellers are like, I just need to get this meeting. I need to get this deal. And it's almost the same with marketing. Like we want to, we want to get everything all out there so that it's all front and center and present. But really you're just trying to get people to engage first of all, because if you can't get them to respond and you can't get them to engage, you're not going to get any further than that. So make that your goal to be engaging and communicating, not get the meeting, get the deal, get the next step in. It's a shift in mindset for sure. Yeah. I mean, and they are mutually exclusive, right? Because the more that you build that first relationship, the more likely you are to end up having a longer term relationship. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's one of my favorite metrics is lifetime value, right? Because if people are churning in there, if you did the heavy handed tactics and let's say you acquired people and then they just burn, they, they, they jump They're they're churning, they're, they're like, they're not just churning, they're churning angrily. <laughs> then you've got it. never done happily usually yeah well i mean there's 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 cases where you just lost to a different competitor because mm -hmm. maybe budget maybe preference maybe needs shifted um you know for example if someone starts off with one crm and then they outgrow its capabilities mm -hmm. you know and they they go with more of an enterprise level one that kind of churn is more friendly you know it's more neutral um for someone who desperately needs your product, but just can't stand you because you set the wrong expectations, you didn't treat them right, and mm -hmm. they just didn't get what they wanted or needed from the relationship. Yeah. Um, sorry, that's my soapbox, right? Um <laughs> Well, when, you know, an interesting thing about churn, um, I actually, I wrote about in this in my book that's coming up in September, is a lot of uh, people assume that churn happens after the sale when they get into onboarding and customer success. It's a customer success issue. It's a customer experience issue when we're facing churn in our companies. Um, and uh, Mark Roberge, who was the CRO at HubSpot in the early days, is now a senior lecturer at Harvard. He had done a regression analysis on a churn issue that was happening at HubSpot in the early days. And on the podcast that he gave around this, he just he talked about how his, you know, everybody thought that the reason for the churn was due to the customer uh, customer success rep, rep. You know, there was some issue going on in onboarding and implementation that caused them to churn later on. And the thing that was interesting is that he found that when he went and looked at where it was coming from, it didn't tie back to anything happening in customer success, but he was seeing patterns happening with who the salesperson that sold them and how they were sold to begin with. So it was actually the buying experience that then later caused churn. And it was when they started changing the mindset behind sales from like, we do whatever it takes to get the deal, to do whatever it takes to do what's right by the buyer and the customer and setting the proper expectations in the, in the sale, then churn went down as a result. So, you know, and there's other data that's out there from, um, you know, other companies that have examined churn in, in SaaS tech companies, for example. And, you know, one of the things that they found is that your likelihood of churn rises exponentially the bigger the discount that you gave them in the sales process. And if you're giving a discount in the sales process because you're not able to sell it on your, any other way, then you're not doing your job in sales. Yeah, you have not established the value. That... Um... In my wall of books, there's a wonderful book about uh, luxury strategy. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that in like the economies of luxury is that people will accept flaws and pay a higher price for a, a flawed but transparent product. Mm -hmm. They're okay with it not being perfect. They just want to know 
what it is that the problem is going to be. And then they just choose to accept it and, and pay whatever they're going to pay anyways. And exactly. so, you know, what you're talking about with the sales process, I, I totally see it. Um, discounts, uh, discounts are not. Discounts need as- to die. They just need to die. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're great for me if I want to go shopping on like President's Day weekend or the 4th of July, but they're not great as a long-term strategy to build value with other people. No, it, it's it, it's it's a salesperson's lazy way to create a false sense of urgency because they haven't uncovered a compelling reason for them to make a change and a compelling reason for their solution to make that change happen. Um, you know, you, it's interesting you said with the luxury brands that they're willing to accept flaws as long as they know about them and they're transparent about them. Uh, some of the research that I came across when I was writing Buyer First was that there's something called the IKEA effect. Have you ever heard of this before? Um, please explain it to me just in case. So IKEA, the store where you go and you buy something and then you get to put it together yourself. So some Harvard researchers wanted to find out uh, would people be willing to pay more for something that they put together themselves versus something that was put together for them by an expert? And what they were surprised to find is that people were willing to pay much more for something that they had a collaboration in creating, like they had done something, they had put some skin in the game themselves and some effort, and they felt that that had more value than the thing that was put together for them by an expert, which tells me that, and, and you know, there's additional research and studies that show that people want to feel like they're being collaborated with, not marketed to or at or sold to an ad. Uh, you know, you think about all of the, the things that happen today with even subscription brands, like my hair care, I use pros hair care. Then I go online and I create a quiz and I then t- take the information from that quiz and the information that I've given them. And then they create this profile for my hair, which is looking pretty fabulous today. Um, and then that that collaboration helps me to put more value on their product because it's specially designed for me. This is where I see sales and marketing going in the future. I love it. Absolutely. Because when it turns into an us instead of a me versus you, right. you've completely changed what's the scenario and, and who, where the affinity lies. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe the stickiness of the relationship too. Right. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So um, now we mentioned, you mentioned product, product led growth versus sales led growth. Where do you see the the commonalities and kind of that middle if we were to put them in a Venn diagram? So the the commonalities that I see between the two is that we both require you to meet the buyer where they are in their process, Um, whether it's in the sales-led growth side. So the mistakes that I see in the sales-led growth side is that we're going to make everybody go through our checklist of discovery questions. Then we're going to go to our next phase of demo where we're going to show you all of these particular features. Doesn't really matter what those questions were. We're going to still do the same demo. And then we're going to then go into our qualification and band. And do you have the budget and the authority and the timeline to make this happen? And we go through all of our steps in the process. Um, And then on the other side of it, when you're talking about product-led growth, the issues that I sometimes see with that is that there isn't a lot of challenging or question asking to really uncover what's going on. It's more of a, okay, you want to see this, here's that, now what's next, now what's next. And instead it's, you know, either I'm going to lead it or they're going to lead it. And the intersection I think is that when we're able to find out where the buyers are at and where they're trying to get to and understanding the gap in between there and why that gap is a compelling reason for them to make the jump that we combine the sales led and the product led growth to, you know, for example, um, the way that I coach and train my sellers and leaders in how to run a sales process like this is to understand, all right, what are the three most important things that you wanna uncover on this particular conversation? Why are those three things important? What's happening now that you don't think that this is working? What have you tried? What's worked? What hasn't worked? What's the impact of that? Now, what if you could do it this way and you give them a piece or a snapshot of how this solution might particularly fit within their their scheme of things? It's a combination of leading with sales growth understanding questions, but then giving them the product information they need to satisfy that particular requirement so that they can get in their mind, okay, we are going in the right direction with this. This is something that can solve the immediate issues and problems that we have now. It's worth exploring more. It's not one or the other. It's a combination of the two, which is how most of things are in life. 
I love it. And, and as you're saying this, what, what goes in my hamster wheel is yes. Okay. And so now you get that on a gong recording and then you put out content that, um, or you use those keywords or you, you know, create social media or events, or, you know, you market it up using that information of what the people, a wider, you know, Mm -hmm. statistically significant amount of people are there looking for. Um, also to make it easier for the sales teams to just be prepared with those answers. Yes. Be prepared with those answers and then be prepared with the what questions is it that you need to ask to get a further understanding of what's really going on. Um, it's again, that one of those things, it's like you either ask all the questions or you give all the answers. It's always a combination of the two because you can't give an answer sometimes if you don't fully understand the issue that's going on, which is why sequential open-ended questions to clarify that before you start pitching and prescribing and diagnosing, you know, there's nothing worse than waiting 45 minutes in a doctor's office after they have all of your medical records to then go in to give them all that information again, to spend 10 minutes with them to tell you what's wrong with you. And they have absolutely no idea other than what they see on a chart. And that's how happens in sales and marketing sometimes today is that, you know, we do all of this work in marketing to get all of these messages out there, assume that the buyer understands it and goes with that. And then we get them in the room and it's 10 minutes of, tell me this, tell me this, tell me this. Okay, here's your problem. You should buy this. Not much of an experience. No, no, (laughs) it feels... Oh, I'm just, uh, it feels so cringy. Um, right. Like no one, no one wants to be patronized or condescended to. And, and especially when, you know, in the B2B setting, not that we all have the luxury of just wasting time being sold to for no reason. Um, but like time is, is, is of the essence, right? Like if, if you're collecting, more than two people or even two people sometimes into one meeting. It's just, you just got to finesse it differently. Um, (laughs) Yes. But, um, you know, so, so one of the things that you mentioned was questions. And I think that good question asking is a great way to signal understanding and connection. Mm -hmm. Um, What are some of your favorite questions that you've kind of, found powerful. Um, so <laughs> when I, I'm, I'm laughing because I'm thinking back to when I first started doing, you know, sort of my own transformation in sales and thinking differently about sales and acting differently in sales. And, you know, one of the things that I would, I would always, I started asking questions and practicing on everybody around me, not just in my sales conversations. And of course, you know, I work from home and my husband is probably the only actual physical person that I see on any given week sometimes. So he was the one I practiced on all the time. And so it used to be that he would come home from work and he would complain about all of these issues that were happening at work. And I'm a management consultant. So of course I have advice to give. And I'd start telling him, well, you should do this and you should do that. And you know, that guy's crazy and you should say this. And his reaction was, you have no idea what it's like there. You don't know what this guy is like. That's never going to work here. You know, can we just, you know, forget it and move on now? And he'd get all upset with me. And I would get upset with him because like, no, you don't think my advice is valuable, but whatever. When I started asking questions like, has it always been this way? Why do you think that this is still continuing to happen? What do you think's going on in their mind when these particular things happen? And these kinds of simple open-ended, you know, who, what, where, why, how kinds of questions that are simple, that are non-threatening, they're uncomplicated, can really easily get people to open up. And when I started practicing asking these kinds of questions on my husband, all of a sudden our conversations completely changed. He went from being annoyed that I was giving him advice to, I had never thought of it that way. Maybe I could try this. And he started coming up with new ideas and thinking about things differently. Um, there's some research that came out from Hartford and Stanford University a couple of years ago that talks about these kinds of open-ended sequential questions that when we ask these kinds of questions, when we get people to share what they think and how they've gone about it and what your opinions and thoughts are on a particular thing, the person who's being asked the question suddenly, like who of us doesn't like to talk about the things we think about? We love talking about what we think, right? Like that's what podcasting is all about. And why I love being on podcasts, because it releases this dopamine in my brain, which is, you know, creates this pleasure for me and a reward system for me. 
And what happens is that at the same place in our brain where this dopamine is taking place is also the same place in our brain where we form relationship attachments, where we start to build trust with people. So as a salesperson or a marketer, when you're asking these kinds of open-ended sequential, sequential clarification questions to understand more, you're actually in the process of building trust with someone. But the other thing that happens is that the person who's being asked the questions starts to see things differently. Their perspectives on their problems, their perspectives on their solutions and options to solve those problems start to change. It's almost like that, you know, you've had that experience when you've talked with your friends and you're struggling with an issue and you just start talking out loud about it. And even though they haven't said anything by the end of it, you, you figured out what it is that you want to do. My husband does that all the time. He's like, do I even need to be involved in this conversation or can I just like step over here? <laughs> but that's what's happening is, is as we're talking these things out with other people and, and, and voicing the things that are in our head, suddenly we start to see them more clearly. And when we ask these kinds of questions, we're doing that with our buyers. And that helps us to then move conversations and decisions forward. Absolutely. And I don't want to come across as sounding... Um back to that hard sales way, but letting people come up with your solution as their own idea is superior than telling them yes. that it's the right way to do it. And, yes. you know, maybe this is just my perspective as, you know, a, a, a partner or, you know, in family life or in different places, but it, it works very, very effectively to do the sequential questioning and be like, you know, well, what do you want to do today? Do yeah. you want to do something active? Do you want to maybe go to this one or this one, present two choices? And then ta-da, you have one of the two choices you wanted. And I, I mean, it, 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 it works in my life. I'm not sure if that's necessarily the sales approach you want to go with, but in a way it is what we do when we have the three levels of psychological pricing do you want the basic skin and bones one? Do you want this one that you're probably going to pick? Or do you want the extra fancy one, which, you know, if we're lucky, you'll pick two. Um, <laughs> I mean, we, we rely on the narrowing of decisions and then coupled with letting people think it's their, their own idea by the questioning it, it, it does feel better for everybody involved. It does. Well, and the person who's asking the question, the thing that happens in our minds when we ask these kinds of questions and we're fully in the present moment and we're actively listening and we're controlling our emotions so we're not all wrapped up in our heads so we can actually hear clearly. When we ask these kinds of questions, it helps us to better understand where they are, where they're coming from, where they're trying to get to. So it actually helps us to build our empathy with them. This is the power of asking good, open-ended, sequential questions. And it's not an interrogation, but it's just a natural kind of a conversation, one that's built out of curiosity. Yeah, definitely. And, and it builds rapport. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've got to ask, is there ever a time when this type of strategy or, or mindset is, is a bad fit? There are times where, say, for example, uh, you're dealing with a high level executive there, uh, you know, there's data from Gong that suggests that, you know, on average, you want to ask between 10 to 14 questions in a discovery call to really have a chance of winning that deal later on. But when you're talking with executives, you want to reduce the number of questions that you're asking because their tolerance for being asked questions is going to be relatively low. And or lower. And the other part of it is that if you think about it, when you are going and you're talking with an executive, at that point, you've probably talked with their team, you've talked with the other people that are stakeholders on their team. So you should have a sense of what's going on without having to ask them all those same types of clarification questions. So instead, what you want to then be able to do is create very targeted questions that share, this is the information, this is what we've discovered, and then add some type of an insight that maybe they didn't fully realize or hadn't considered before for and then ask your targeted diagnostic question about, you know, how do you see this playing out in your team or the impact that that would have and limiting that number of questions and creating that targeted question based on the information that you've learned before. The other times and places where this doesn't really work is where, you know, it requires someone on the other end to be open-minded to, to sharing that information. Um, 
I have a client or a couple of clients with mine. Uh, one, her, her name was Ellie and Ellie is, she's a very type A person. She's, you know, in the Isra Israeli army and military. And she's just like, do, 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 this is how we're going to get it done. And when I first started working with her, um, she, she struggled with like the small talk and the building rapport and those kinds of things. And, you know, so she was meeting with someone and she was trying to, you know, start to ask these kinds of open-ended questions. And she was getting all of these one word answers. And, you know, which was really unusual because she had talked with this gentleman before and he was really kind of open and warm. And now they're face to face and she's asking questions again. And he's like one word answers and he seems very curt. And she was in enough state of mind and presence of mind to, to think, all right, something is up here and I'm not going to just ignore it and plow through. And so she stopped with her questions and she's like, how are you feeling today? And he just looked at her. He's like, you know, my plane was late. There's an issue at home going on with my kid. The talk that I was supposed to give has just been moved up by two hours. And I'm scrambling to figure out what it is that I'm going to do. And I'm a little stressed right now. And she had the wherewithal and the frame of mind to understand that now is not the time to be asking these questions. And, you know, that takes a certain level of emotional control and being present in the moment and having empathy for someone to say, let's reschedule this for later because you're not in the frame of mind right now where you're going to be able to be open to answering these kinds of questions. So that's when it's not a good idea to just keep plowing ahead with these kinds of questions. You have to have an idea of what's going on with the person on the other side before you start diving into it. Absolutely. I mean, that emotional intelligence is not like you can't even you cannot overestimate its power um because you know this that, is how that, we beat the bots right this is how we're yeah. going to be ai in the bots is that we still crave and need that human connection and until we are comfortable as a species with machines making life or death decisions for us we're still going to want that human connection and so we have to get out of the do this do that this is the step and this is the question and we have to be human it seems so simple, but so difficult. Well, we're, we're so complicated as humans. And that's what, what I think the, the fun part is, is just figuring people out. Because people, yeah, well, yeah there's, there's rules, but there's not. Like, everyone's... Yes, yeah, humans are fascinating creatures. I, I will never get bored of studying them. Love it. Um, so... Oh, yeah, like, we're... AI is a whole new, whole new ballgame, but... But it's also about doing non-scalable things, right? Mm -hmm. So so there's things that scale and there, there's things that should scale. And then there's things that shouldn't scale and you should not try to do it in mass and you should give it the attention it deserves, motto e motto. Um, I feel like we're talking about automation sequences and workflows right now. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, um, all of it, um, yes. all of it, you know, there's, there's a time and place for an automation sequence and it's not all bad and it's not all good. It's not, yeah. none of these strategies or tactics are going to be a silver bullet. Um, they have to be used at discretion, knowing, yes. knowing your people. Um, so, you know, coming back to, to that, um, where, where do you think the future is going with marketing and sales? Uh, and where do you think it should go in comparison? So where I think it's going, I think right now we're at a place that we were back in 1995 to 2003, where the internet just kind of, you know, 93 was really the first year that the internet was commercially available for people, the same year I graduated high school. And yes, I know I'm aging myself. Um, but and if you think about back then, it was this big rush, right? Like everybody was rushing to be, you know, online and, and do all of these things online and the web is going to change everything and the world is going to burn and, you know, all of that. Then we had the big internet crash where the bubbles happened and everybody kind of took a step back a little bit from it and then started to think about it like, you know, it wasn't the gold rush anymore. Now it's like, okay, what, how are we going to actually settle down with this thing? What are the actual sort of slower impacts that we're going to see? And that's where we are right now again with AI. Um, so where I think it's going right now, I think the direction that it's going is that everybody's going to rush to get onto the ship called AI, AI Titanic. And we're all going to like make it across the sea in this great big huge thing. The Titanic is going to sink and there's going to be some people that make it. And what's going to happen is that when they're going to then look at how do we actually put this into the context of the real value that it has. And 
you know, instead of it being the gold rush and, you know, everybody's rushing to it, it's going to be a more thoughtful approach to it. How is it going to help us enhance the human experience, not replace the human experience? And I think that a lot of people, like I just got an email earlier today about how online is or how AI is going to replace this and why it's such a great big risk to this, this and that. And, and I just kind of, all right, go ahead and, you know, lock yourselves in the cave somewhere and freak out about it. I'm just waiting to kind of see how it happens. I'm trying it out and testing it out in certain ways and places and seeing how can it help me to be more effective in my human activity. So, you know, if AI can help me to write the first draft of something and do some research for me so that I can have, instead of a blank page, I have a starter that I can then add my human uh, intellect and capital and empathy to, I'm all for that. If it helps me to have a better connection with someone else, but I don't see it as this thing that's going to replace sales and it's going to replace people writing and it's going to wipe it all out. Is it going to change it? Sure. But it's figuring out how it's going to change it to help you to have a better process for yourself and experience with others. That's going to be the real place where I think it should be ending up to go. And that's kind of how I see it's going to be is that those that just, you know, plug it into the AI and have it write it out for them and then send it off somewhere. You know, those are the ones that are, you know, it's like when SEO first came out and pay-per-click came out and they still had the mentality of old school advertising when they first started doing it. And now since then it has evolved to become something so much more as far as like funnel economics is called. So I think that's where it's going to end up. And I'm hoping and wishing and praying that instead of everybody rushing forward and freaking out over it, that they take a kind of calm step and to look at, all right, how is this going to actually integrate into how I'm doing things now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, part of what you said made me reminisce about when data science like first took off. Mm -hmm. And the I love the emperor has no clothes fable. And I feel like it's so applicable to so many of these trends. But, uh, you know, I, I hate to, to spoil it for people, but almost, not almost all, but a significant proportion of machine learning and um, data science that's actually happening are just fancy linear regressions. <laughs> and, and, like, honestly, most of what a data scientist spends their day on is cleaning up human errors, making sure things are, like, matching up that they make sense, you know, mm -hmm. validating the data. Um, it's, it's not this, it, it, it's not like cooking up something in a lab that's a magic formula to the future. You yeah. Know, it's, 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 and it's, that's the kind of thinking that made the internet bubble happen. That's the kind of thinking that's going to make the AI bubble happen is that it is this, everybody wants the magic pill. That's going to make them lose a hundred pounds in 10 days. Right. A AI is still lines of code. It's the same, you know, it's just a, different language but it's it's yes. lines of code mm -hmm. and you know you get in what you put in and it's i i personally don't want to sit around and train an ai to respond to me appropriately when i could just do it correctly myself the first <laughs> time <laughs> just adds another chore to my list of things to do yeah um but there's benefits you know I, i've i've heard a lot of people um echo your your thoughts about having it be support system right and there's there's a lot of benefit to that especially you know if it's looking for making there's shortcuts for sure to be had you know analyzing word clouds or different things like that but finding out things i mean for me i look at it as a way for me to you know, instead of me going to five different places on the web to find information, if I can have a AI bot that goes out and finds this relevant information for me that I can then look at and check and make sure that it's, you know, credible and accurate, instead of me having to actually just try and find it and saves me time, I'm all for that. Yeah, absolutely. Or, you know, if, if Amazon is using AI to tell me, you know, five things that it thinks I want to buy, so I don't have to search for those five things. I, I like some convenience like that. Like, please, yeah. you know, like go for it. You know, I ultimately decide whether or not I'm going to buy it, but yeah. yeah, I found some great new music and bands because AI analyzed the kinds of music and beats that I like to listen to and then found other songs or other artists that are similar to that. And so I've discovered all kinds of new things that I wouldn't have found on my own by listening to the same old playlist. Yeah. Like when Pandora was brand spanking new, it did that. And it was like, it's whole value prop. And now we've right. got like all of these different ones. Um, there's a lot of fun to be had with this for sure. Um, so 
you know, I know that in the next few months, you've got some big things coming up. Yeah. Could you tell me about them? Uh, so on April 20th, so my book comes out September 5th, um, which is buy your first, how to grow your business with collaborative selling. And on April 20th, we're doing a special pre-order day where, uh, if you pre-order the book on April 20th specifically, and, uh, what'll happen is that if you forward the copy of the receipt of the pre-order that you've done, whether it's an individual or a team of people, um, then what I will do is create an invite only sort of session for those people where we'll get a sneak peek into the book before it comes out and, you know, do a little bit of a workshop and training for people to get some quick wins in their sales processes now so that when the book comes out later on, and we've already had some people that have had some experience with it. So I'm really excited for that because uh, I want to get it in the hands of people as quickly as possible. Like I'm literally finishing up edits this week and I'm just waiting for people like to see it and to try it out. So this is a way that I can kind of give a little sneak peek into it and uh, get some feedback from people and how it's impacting them later on. Um, I'm really excited for that. Um, and then, you know, September 5th, we're going to be doing a big launch of the Buyer First book at Inbound in Boston that week. Uh, so we're going to be doing lots of sessions and talks and, you know, having a lot of like interviews and videos and things like that. So I'm really excited for that. And then and then the idea is to is you know uh, next end of this year and into next year is just you know traveling around the world, kind of bringing this message of making it all about our buyers and not about us, and how to change our mindsets around sales so that we can have better conversations and sell with our buyers, not at them and to them. Love it! That's so exciting. It's going to be so great. Um, I can't wait. And just. What a tremendous value, um, not to sound like an infomercial myself, but like, what a, but it, like, that's pretty cool that you're going to sit there and de- like, like workshop with people that, yeah. that are in search of that. You know, I think that that's something that, you know, is going to help like raise the tide for everybody. Um, and I'm really excited to hear about those results and read the book. I've seen little bits and pieces yeah. um, and I'm so excited. I, I definitely think this message needs to be kind of shouted from the rooftop. So, yeah, we need to change the perception that people have of sales that, you know, we still think of the pushy, slimy used car salesman when the majority of us think of sales and that impacts how we actually act when we have to get into a sales conversation. And there are, there are specific mindsets and psychologies behind those mindsets that impact the behaviors that we have. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you know, the things that you should do and you know that you can do them, but why is it that when you get in the moment to do it, you can't seem to quite do the things you know you can and should do, you know, like we know we should eat vegetables and exercise, but we don't actually do it. Why is that? Like, this is the thing that I've been kind of obsessed with since I can remember of why do people not do the things they know they should, that's good for them. And then why do they do the things that they know are bad for them, but they do it anyway. And it really comes down to our beliefs and mindsets about those particular things that impact us. Um, so much of sales coaching and training and advice that's out there are tactical. This is this hack and this process and this acronym, and it's the alphabet soup of hacks and processes. And we still haven't seen much of a 50, more than a 50% increase in the ability of people to actually reach their numbers and quotas and goals. So obviously something is missing. And I think the thing I know that the thing is that's missing is it's not about what you do, but it's about how you think about the things that you're doing, that it's going to make the biggest impact. For sure. Yeah. I mean, there's so much quota that's just not being met and lots of reasons, but one of them is just how you try to do it. Yeah. It's when we make it all about ourselves and our products and what we want that prohibits us from being collaborative with our buyers. Like we were talking about in the beginning and asking those kinds of questions. We just want to get to the point where we can pitch what we do so you can buy it. Yeah. And no one wants to just feel like you're tolerating them so you can talk. No, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. <laughs> it's the long and short of it. No one wants to feel like that. Yeah. And, 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 and you're listening just so you can figure out what it is that you can say next. Definitely. I mean, yes. we all know what face that looks like when we see it across from us. Yes, we do. Exactly. Uh, well, hopefully I'm not making that face now, but I do want to remember to, if people want to reach out to you, how should they do that? Um, and maybe if you could spell out like letter by letter. Yeah. Um, so obviously you can find me on LinkedIn um, by my name. It's LinkedIn backslash in, you know, Carol Mahoney, C-A-R-O-L-E-M-A-H-O-N-E-Y. So don't forget the E's. 
Um, you can also go to my new website that I have up that's for the book and the speaking engagements that I do, which is carolmahoney.com. So C-A-R-O-L-E-M-A-H-O-N-E-Y. Um, and then you can also reach me on my other website where I do all of my sort of corporate training programs for individuals and teams at unboundgrowth.com, which is U N B O U N D G R O W T H. A lot of people confuse it with inbound and outbound. It's unbound because it's unlimited. Awesome. I love it. Thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, listeners, if you could, as usual, my requests are that you like, subscribe, review, reach out with any ideas or questions. And hopefully you enjoyed all this because I know I did. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Leanne. It's, it's not very often that I get to talk about marketing anymore. So <laughs> this has been good and refreshing for me. And, and you know, I came into sales I'm sorry, I can't went into marketing because I hated the idea of sales. And then when I changed my mindset about what sales was, I knew that I could have a bigger impact there. And but I still, you know, I still have a marketing heart that just won't go anyway. Yeah, they're they're like conjoined twins, really. They really are. They really are. <laughs> well, thank you again. Thank you, Leanne. You've been listening to Marketgy, the science of marketing strategy. If any of the strategies we talked about today inspired you to learn more, try them. Remember, the perfect strategy doesn't exist, only the one that gets done. Subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast player to make sure that you never miss an episode. Thanks for listening. Until next time.